we talk about BT cotton and boll worms, there are a few questions that, that typically come to mind. Uh, over the last couple of years, uh, we've been having some issues. So, so the first question we typically have is, is what's going on with these BT cottons? Am I still getting acceptable levels of caterpillar control uh, with this technology? And since I'm paying for it up front, is it paying for itself uh, in the field with the level of control that it's given me? Uh, another question is uh, because we are uh, putting a lot of foliar insecticides over the top of some of these BT cottons, how often should I expect to do that sort of thing? And if I'm going to be doing that, is it going to pay for itself? Uh, and lastly, since we do have some new ones in the pipeline, how are they going to stack up against what's uh, currently available to us? If you look at uh, some data that I pulled out of the Beltwide Cotton Conference proceedings on uh, number of insecticide applications targeting boll worms and BT cotton in the Mid-South, we've been averaging, uh, for the most part, one, one application uh, for boll worms over the top of BT. Uh, over the last couple of years, we moved up to one and a half, close to two applications uh, targeting this pest over the top of technology that we were paying for to control it. So why, why are we doing this? Well, the last couple of years have been a, a little bit of a different ball game for us. Uh, a number of uh, research and entomologists with uh, various universities across the Mid-South have had uh, no difference showing responses in yield to uh, insecticide treatments over the top of these dual gene BT cottons. Uh, as a matter of fact, there were some issues, um, presumed issues with BT resistance in boll worm last year. I don't think there was much to that, but uh, that's just the level of, of uh, damage and survival that we were seeing in these cottons uh, over the last couple of years. So just to give you an example of what we have been seeing, uh, Scott mentioned Prevathon, very active insecticide, against boll worms produced by DuPont, has a very long residual. Uh, it's been used in a number of studies, uh, and, and the reason being is it almost allows you complete protection of this thing, so you can really see if you can get a yield difference uh, between treated and untreated and, uh, BT cotton. But in the non-BT, where you treat it twice, about two and a half to three weeks apart with Prevathon, and I think these initial applications were made on egg lays, we had a 753 pound limb increase in the non-BT. Well, that's not that big a deal. We've seen this before with high retoids and, and that sort of thing. But when you move down to uh, the wide strike technology, Bogar 2 technology, we're still seeing, uh, for the most part, significant yield increases. Do take a note of this particular bar here, the Delta Pine 1050, which is a little bit later material and variety than the others in that particular test. We actually saw a yield decrease where we spray. So th this doesn't fit everywhere. Um, it, it has a lot to do with when the insects are present. Um, I think that probably had to do with the difference in material characteristics uh, and ability to compensate in those later material varieties. This is not the only place that we saw this um, with different material uh, cottons this year, uh, but just, just to point that out. Another trial from, from Dr. Gus Lorenz in Arkansas also shows pretty much the same thing. Uh, again, over 600 pound lint increase from prevalent line application of the non-BT. Uh, then we're looking at uh, Bogart 2 and wide strike and then another Bogart 2. So anywhere from 150 to over 300 pound lint increase from two applications of And again, this is over the top of dual gene BT cotton, which we don't expect to be losing that much yield to one of our target pests. Uh, another example is from uh, Scott Stewart in Tennessee. Uh, again, we have the Prevathon treatments on the uh, different cotton technologies. Look at Delta Pine 174 or 9BT. Uh, almost 2,500 pounds of seed cotton uh, where it was sprayed twice, I believe, where it was sprayed only once. Uh, we did lose some yield, but again, we saw a yield increase for Bogart 2, Bogart 2, Wide Strike, and again, another 9BT. So again, we're seeing significant yield increases um, behind these sprays over the top of BT cotton. We had some studies that we initiated this year as well uh, looking to see if we could show that based on threshold levels of larvae. So those published in the Mississippi State University guidelines. Um, 
where we actually triggered insecticide applications of either uh, carotid, one of our old standard high recoil insecticides, compared to one of the new diamide class uh, insecticides, cordon, or uh, now as prevathon. Um, but we had again different uh, technologies. We had the 9BT, a couple of different Bogard twos, and a wide strike with either karate or cordial treatments. So again, these plots were scouted individually. Our uh, 9BT plot in this particular location triggered four applications of karate, only two of cordial. Again, it's more active, has a longer residual, so you would expect fewer applications. All of our other BT technologies uh, triggered one shot each. Now, what's that really mean? We took yields from these plots. And uh, our non-BT really didn't surprise us too much. So we got a pretty significant yield increase from uh, the four karate applications and two applications of Prevathon even improved that. Uh, so that again, this is kind of what we had expected for the non-BT. Not quite what I expected with the new gene BT technologies uh, that we had in the study as well. <coughs> Saw pretty much the same stair step with Delta 9 0912, 4288, a stone variety, and 575. Uh, so, so again, uh, we're, we're getting increases not just because of the new classes of chemistry that we're testing, uh, foliar chemistry, because we've got the got the pyrethroid and that's been around for years and we're still getting yield increases there. Uh, so it's not just the class of chemistry, so it, it, we're having an issue both times here. We'll move to another site <clears throat> where we had higher pressure. Uh, as you can see, where eight applications of karate were triggered in the 9BT, three uh, applications of cordial or prevathon in, in the 9BT. And for either the BTs, it was either one or two applications. So we had significant populations here at this site. And we saw something a little different. For the 9BT, uh, it was actually the same stair step as you saw at the other site, uh, where karate improved uh, yields over the untreated and prevathon or cordial improved yields beyond that. But for the uh, dual gene BT varieties, we didn't really see that stair step that was reversed. This particular site, we had pretty, uh, pretty significant plant bug populations. And uh, it looks like that that karate application was giving us a little activity against plant bugs in these particular tests. So that is something that you need to consider when you're choosing what insecticide to spray over the top of these pipes. Not necessarily the target pest that you're going after, but any, any other incidental pest that may be out there at the same time. Because uh, this, again, this is not the, the only time we saw this this year. We also saw this at our you know, site in Stonewall, Mississippi, on our research station. So what does all that really mean? Well, if you get down to the, to the dollars and, and cents, uh, Dr. Clint Allen did an economic analysis on this, and this is the returns above Caterpillar control costs uh, for these locations that reached threshold uh, for bold worms. So in the non-BT, uh, pyrethroid improved uh, returns, but the prevathon was a better choice there uh, for bow worm control. But if you look in the uh, Bogar 2 or the wide strike, there's really no difference between those two. We made more applications with the pyrethroid than we did with prevathon, cordial, uh, but the cost difference there um, kind of made up for that. So. So what we're seeing here is either one of those products would be economically feasible in controlling bull worms over the top of this dual gene cotton. So why are we seeing this? Is, is it, are we having problems with bull worm resistance to BT? Uh, why did we not see this early on and now the last couple of years all of a sudden we're seeing significant yield increases from sprays? This is really noisy, uh, but let, let me just simplify it briefly. Um, this is pheromone trap captures of bowl worm in the Mississippi Delta from 2006 to 2011. This line right here represents 50 bowl worm miles captured per trap. Uh, those numbers from 06 to 09 hover right around that line, maybe a little higher, a little lower. When you move up to 2010 to 2011, those numbers hover around the 100 
50 lines. So the last two years we've had roughly two to three times the population of bullworms that we had the previous four or five years. And I think that has a lot to do with why we're seeing what we are seeing in these BT cops. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't prove it, and I guess I still can't prove it, but I, I got to thinking about it. I said, well, I'm going to look back in the beltwide proceedings of all the, all the field studies that have looked at, at the control of bullworm and BT cotton with insecticide. And uh, I want to take a look and see if there's any type of relationship between the level of infestation of bullworm and uh, whether or not you get a yield benefit from spraying BT cotton came up with, I think, 10, I believe that's 10 uh, data points there. And so what this shows here, this number right here, the closer it is to one, tells you how good of a relationship you have between this variable and this variable. <coughs> so that's pretty doggone close to one, which tells me that the relationship between the percent fruit damage found in the non-BT cotton, which is really a measure of how significant an infestation that you have a bowl worm, that tells me that that is, um, relates very closely to the percent yield increase that you're going to get when you spray Bogart 2 with an insecticide. Now, am I always going to have to spray my Bogart 2 cotton or why I strike cotton with insecticide with Bogart? The answer is no. Uh, and actually, believe it or not, the, uh, with the numbers that we had this year uh, throughout the Mississippi Delta, we have two sites. Uh, that never triggered a threshold application in the non-BT. Uh, this was one of the sites in Walls, Mississippi, which is not too far south of here. Uh, these are the returns from these four varieties, non-BT, two bowl guards, and a wide strike. Or some sorry, two bowl guard tubes, and a wide strike. Another site, Highland Ridge, Mississippi, which actually is very close to our research station. Again, uh, we basically didn't have any, any uh, bowl worms in this test. Uh, and you can see the Stonewall variety here actually gave us the best returns. Uh, the 9BT was actually better than the 0912 and the 375, but all this is is agronomic characteristics here in this particular location. So moving on to some of the new things, we have Twin Leaf and Bogart 2 comparison. I got this data from Scott Stewart. Uh, so Twin Link is Bayer's new product that's going to be coming on hopefully in 2013. This is a combination of several uh, tests across the United States, but in these tests we basically had 100% bowl damage in our non-BT. Our two twin links performed very well with respect to bowl worm control, and they compared very well with those of uh, two commercially available bowl guard two varieties. Uh, some information from Scott Stewart in Jackson, Tennessee, that uh, where he had some yields for twin link and bowl guard two. Um, again, you can see pretty low yield here in the untreated non-BT versus the treated non-BT. Uh, we did better with the twin link, the two twin link varieties here, and again, they were comparable to what you got from both R2. So what we got coming in the future looks like it's going to be comparable to what we have now with respect to bowl water control. Uh, just another idea of uh, how good some of this technology actually is when you put it to the test. Uh, this is one of these tests from Dr. Jeremy Green in South Carolina. You can pick out the plots that didn't receive uh, any insecticide applications, didn't have any BT genes, and then you see all the white around it, and that's the different BT varieties that are in those plots. So this stuff is still doing its job. It's doing well. It just can't do it all. So to summarize quickly, we had those few questions that we talked about. At the, at the beginning, the various BT technologies alone, they do provide substantial yield protection when exposed to low to moderate bullworm infestations. <clears throat> and they do pay for themselves, as you can see from some of the returns that we showed. But all the BT technologies, it doesn't matter which one you pick, at some point they're going to require supplemental applications of insecticides, uh, particularly when we have high populations of bullworm. And, uh, as you can see from the data that we generated the last couple of years, these can definitely pay for themselves when they apply to the